Well, hey, and off we go. Rich, lovely to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. How's things with you? Yeah, good. Thanks for having me back. Good. And Jay, lovely to see you as well. Thank you for joining us. How's things? Really good. Thanks, Nathan. Busy week, but all good. Very good. So just for those listening today, this is the second in our series of occasional marketing. And today we're joined by Rich from reviews.io. Now, today I'm really keen to take your questions around uh, anything reviews related, but particularly around how reviews impact occasional marketing. You've Some of you have already sent in some questions and I've got them here and I'll be asking the panel direct. But if you do have any questions, then please do, do just put them in the comments. I'll pick them up and I'll, uh, I'll help those get fielded for you. And so, guys, let's dive straight in. The first question I've got, Rich, is actually for you, which is really specific around occasional reviews. We've been asked can you have reviews specific to occasion, for example, reviews just for Mother's Day, for Father's Day, for Valentine's, etc., or is the, the split purely product review or company review? It's one of those. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a good question because um, I think when you look at reviews, typically you receive them after an occasion, um, especially a, like over, say, Black Friday is the perfect example because it's probably the only occasion where you'd get reviews you know, after the occasion, you've got Christmas and occasions like that where you have a build up and you can probably post rele relevant reviews around that time. But as Black Friday goes, you're really sort of celebrating afterwards. You want to keep momentum with, re with the reviews. And if you're looking to sort of add content around, you know, trying to convert around those sort of times around Christmas, Valentine's Day, then definitely like you can position reviews on, on any of your web pages and your checkout that is related. Um, to those occasions. I think that's been more personal as well because people are going to be able to relate to that content better than say, you know, uh, any, any, any review content that's quite generic. So if you are able to sort of, you know, customize those experiences for customers, give them a more personal experience, then it's obviously going to have a, a, a positive effect on sort of conversion rate, traffic, you know, anything that you're sort of looking to sort of boost. If you can adapt in any way for occasions, then it's always going to have a positive effect. That's perfect. Thank you, Rich. And Jay, you and I are always talking about personalization and relevance and how we can make someone feel like they're the only person in the world, right? Now, before I dive into that, Jay, I've got a question for you here around the messy middle. And this is some data that I believe has come from Google. I'm hoping you can shed some more light on what is this messy middle? So one of the things that one of the reasons I was particularly excited about today is that is that when we're trying to understand user behavior, well, when we're under, trying to understand what was that trigger that caused someone to say, look for a gift for Mother's Day. So somebody's looking for a gift for Mother's Day. They then go into this infinite loop of, of exploration and they're constantly evaluating and exploring different options. And they might carry out, you know, 500 searches just for the perfect gift. One of the things that we really see is these kind of cognitive biases. What can cause those people to then make a decision that this is the right product for them um, and to actually then go through to complete that purchase? And, and there's no question, social proof, reviews are one of the things that make a difference between whether the person converts or not. Yeah, very well said, Jay. I'm really interested to talk a little bit more a little bit later around Google and their impact with reviews and how we can integrate reviews uh, into uh, kind of ads, etc. Let's come back to you, Rich. I've got one here around ethical reviews. Someone has put with the rise of sustainability in the last 12 to 18 months. I'm interested to see have brands started to collect reviews based on how well their product is sourced or how sustainable their delivery is. Is that something you can do? So I appreciate, again, if you take the, the hospitality space, you might rate something on cleanliness, you might rate something on service, etc. With reviews.io as a platform, can you break it down to choose the kind of categories you're ranked for? Uh, with reviews, I mean, review content today is, isn't just sort of feedback on a single single experience. You can ask additional questions that allows you to sort of say, how did that experience go? Did you feel the product was as good quality as something that's mass produced. Um, so you can really sort of gauge additional information and we massively encourage sort of anybody collecting reviews to do so, especially if you work uh, in sort of those ethical industries uh, where you do need to share that information. So you need to encourage and you need to sort of ask the reviewer additional information, like specific questions of the information that you wanna hear 
you have to ask them. And so the whole review space is, is massively evolving from, you know, that single entity of give us a little bit of feedback to, you know, an entire catalog of information from that one experience. And you can take every bit of that experience and benefit, improve the product, improve the service, find out bottlenecks, you know, and ensuring that that, that experience continues. So you're constantly looking for more information from, from your customers to give them ultimately a better experience. What is, uh, this one's for both of you, and it's around gating reviews. I see some organizations that will essentially send you a, a kind of landing page, if you like, can you rate your experience? Three or four or five go one way, and one or two go the other way. The right thing to do, the ethical thing to do, should businesses be going at it that way or perhaps another way? I think it. I think it. I think it kind of depends on also the user experience. Like how much do you want to gain information from that review and and leverage that review to improve your your product as well? Um, so it might be that that you do want to ask them additional questions. So that would make sense to deliver them to a different page because you can get more valuable feedback. Yeah. To jump onto that as well. Exactly right. It's, it's case by case as well. Um, you've really got to look, look at it holistically and sort of say, how can we better ex improve that experience? Or, you know, not necessarily the experience uh, exclusively, but how can we gauge as much information as possible? Um, and for customers displaying reviews, um, that what information you share is really important too. Um, you, you know, you, you want to make sure that you're showing them the most relevant information that's going to be useful to the, to, to the user to increase conversion. A one for you here around traffic. Is there a way that people can integrate their reviews within, say, a Google ad or a social ad to just add? I appreciate there might be a way through extensions, but perhaps you could just elaborate a bit further on that. So obviously, using a platform like reviews.io, you're able to, to have the fact that Google have got that as an approved method of, of, of getting reviews. And so then organically, if you get the enough reviews, you reach that critical mass where your, your reviews at either product or company level can show within the Google search results. Where we see additional leverage is where you can start using and extracting some of that information into advert copy, landing page experience pull out like the most important information to be able to kind of uh, bring those adverts more to life and bring out those elements that you really want to communicate to the customer so yeah it's not just about getting reviews that that sit on your product page it's about being able to pull that straight into into your advert copy and um and and you know really kind of get that click-through rate up on your ads Sure. And Joe, I appreciate you can do that within the Google platform. If you're running a Facebook ad or an Instagram ad or something like that, are reviews are got a connection there too, so you can include it? Or actually, is it purely going to be a content driven, okay, let's literally copy and paste into our ad? Maybe actually, Rich, that might even be one for you. Is there a social connection already set up so you can pull through an extension to show product based reviews on a Facebook ad? Or actually, can you just do the copy piece? Uh, I'm not entirely sure with the Facebook uh, technicians, um, but regarding sort of um, getting stars in your sort of seller ratings, then uh, I think as Jay said earlier, you've got to meet a threshold. Um, it's got to be sort of uh, from a trusted partner like reviews. Uh, there's many out there. Um, and once you've meet that, met that threshold, then you can feed that content through. Um, that's what's coming sort of that's what's really key in the ads because by having that you're going to sort of increase your click through rate reduce your cost per click you know um whatever you can do to maximize those values is really going to help with your bottom line rich i've had a question just come in here which seems like quite a timely thing to ask and this is about migrating reviews if someone's on and i'm not going to name drop other review platforms but if someone's on a another reviews platform and they've got 500 5000 50000 reviews can they switch them over to reviews.io or how does that work yeah definitely there's been some recent new sort of uh, guides uh, regarding uh, migrating reviews but essentially yeah you can take your review content that you've had and don't allow uh, those other review providers to hold that against you you can remove those reviews and import them into your 
um, say reviews account, and then you can use them within your widget. So you're not going to lose that content. So you're still going to be able to show the same sort of review content as you currently if you do switch. Okay, perfect. Jay, one for you here, or actually one for both of you. And this stems around uh, any data out there about showing a tangible uplifting conversion by integrating reviews. Is there any data out there that you guys know about that says, you know what, sites without reviews convert to X, sites with reviews convert at Y? Does anyone come across any data that can kind of back up the importance of reviews? I don't have any specific numbers because it changes according to, to which sure. client, but it is, it's one of the kind of most six most important um, cognitive biases. Um, you know, once you nail reviews and you also, you, you, you um, involve it in, in from uh, first finding out and landing on the website right through to that complete user experience where the person has received the product, is encouraged to leave a review and then share that review with their audience. You know, it really makes your advertising work a lot harder. Your email marketing can be more efficient. You should be seeing this as a whole part of not only customer acquisition when you're when you're looking at occasion marketing, but also creating loyalty with your customers and and getting them to be your advocates. Nice. I've got a question here, which again for both of you around typical review collection process. Is there a holy grail, Rich, in terms of next steps? So let's say I've purchased a product and I'm now uh, okay. I've just checked out. I've hit a thank you page. Typically, the logical thing would be to trigger an email to say hey, what did you think of the experience, et cetera, or maybe a few days later. Um, yeah, but kind of, oh, thanks so much for purchasing this recent product. Tell us what you thought. And the likes of Amazon, et cetera, do that quite well. Is there a holy grail, Rich, from your experience in terms of it's always should be three days after kind of products purchased or six days after or anything like that? Definitely. Uh, any, as long as it's not sent before the customers haven't received the products, uh we've seen time and time again a lot of negative reviews come through as i've not received these products i've received an invite and you're allowing them to you know to highlight your incapability of you know sending the product to them on time and so ensuring that those reviews are sent out when the customer is at their happiest time uh, so when could be a could be a couple of days after they've received those goods you know depend again it really depends on the product if you're sending them a hot tub you know uh that in, its, in itself is a fun experience. So you should not be getting anything but positive reviews. So ensure that they, you're sending an invite when you know they kind of have it, have it set up. Um, they probably, you probably might know that because they're asking you certain questions. So you, you, know, you know, there's tools out there to help you with that as well. Like Clavio, you can sort of really create unique flows that allows you to get a better understanding of that that uh, purchase process or the, the the customer's journey, where where they are, um, and by triggering it at the right time, you're going to maximise sort of um, review conversion as well as your review score as well. So the the key there is making sure not to send it before they have the products. Definitely, Jane. I guess you would agree. Anything to add to that? Just as a as a customer myself, you know, it, it there's nothing worse than than um, than an automation going wrong, and you realise that you're part of an automation and not part of a personal experience. Um, so being mindful of that, being mindful of delivery times, you know, I, I think we can we can probably stop using the word unprecedented times at the moment. But you know, with all of the the issues with um, shipping at the moment and, and um, businesses really need to make sure that they keep reviewing those automations to make sure that they have got the customer experience at the heart of what they're doing. Yeah, agreed. Uh, guys, I'm interested to know in terms of if you missed the first bite of the cherry. So let's take that hot tub example a bit further. We've ordered the hot tub. We've waited two or three weeks. It's installed. We've maybe had some comms with a client hearing that it's installed or whatever. Fantastic. We then send that first review. That customer, for whatever reason, goes into junk or they just don't get around to it. They don't leave a review. Can we have a second bite of the cherry? And if so, how many bites do we have? A bit like cart abandonment, I guess. How many bites do we have before we go, you know what, we're going to hack this person off if we go back to them every week from now on to say, leave us a review. Rich, again, is there a holy grail to say, look, try two or three times over a period of a few months. If they don't come back, leave them alone? Um, yeah, I mean, for... For for that example, yeah, it comes down to the customer experience. Like you want them to have a positive experience. If if they're likely to shop again, you don't want to be bombarded in their inbox with stuff they're choosing to ignore. 
Um, but like you said, you, you, you can just remind them and say, oh, we'd really, really appreciate that feedback. We, we see that you've also purchased this. So again, with Clavio, you can set up flows to say that we know you're purchasing with us and talk to them at a level. Um, also, if you're looking to sort of build on your seller ratings, you need to ensure that that invite for their first, first shopping experience is done within a month, else you don't actually get the, um, the accreditation to Google seller ratings. So as long as it's in within a month, I think that's an acceptable time to you know, re re-invite them to leave a review. I think you can also be quite creative about it as well. You know, um, Uni, um, the pizza oven company, they they were really great at really kind of communicating the passion that they had about their product and trying to get you to share that passion. I think that I had follow ups kind of with um, pizza dough recipes and and then each time, you know, prompting me or oh, are you able to leave us, us a review and kind of communicating that. The, the tone of voice and the company personality through that process so that you feel like it is worth your time and investment. And if you're an evangelist about the product that you want to share that. And I think that that's where companies particularly get it right. You know, they're offering additional value with those pizza recipes and, and it's, an, that's another bite at the cherry or bite at the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I'm keen to talk about local reviews and local listings uh, Rich, I'm pretty sure reviews.io uh, integrates into Google local listings to allow you to do this. But for those that maybe uh, aren't aware of this, perhaps you could just elaborate a little bit further on the ability to collect local reviews rather than just product or company reviews. Yeah, so this is part of our, our retar- uh, uh, this is part of um, making sure that you can send reviews to more than one location. Um, I think there are some providers that say you can only ask for reviews in, um, in, their, in their review space. But you want to sort of send reviews to places where you know your customers are, like, like within Google reviews or Facebook reviews. So in reviews, we have the ability to improve your reputation. And by doing that, you can set a percentage of your completed orders to, you know, to send to local review collection platforms like Google or like Facebook. Um, so that's really important. So understanding the customer or, or the merchant, uh, you have to ensure that you you know create a good balance between where you're sending people to leave reviews. We don't think it's um, highly essential to have every single review ever submitted onto the reviews.io platform. We know it's essential to you know collect reviews from multiple places. And by doing that, you're gonna build a better reputation, rep- reputation for, for yourselves because people only leave positive reviews when they're actively encouraged to. So if you're not actively encouraged people in people to leave reviews on Facebook or in, in, or into Google, then you're potentially only going to allow them to leave negative reviews because people will find you in those spaces and think, oh, this is a great, a great spot to sort of, you know, leave a negative response because I've had a bad experience. I think this, it, there's an interesting piece here around the British culture as a whole, where typically we buy a product, but we expect a certain level of service. And therefore, if it's an okay service or a good service, sometimes we might not leave a review because we think, you know what, well, that's what I paid for in the first place. However, the Mm. second that a piece of bubble wrap has popped or something's happened that's out of your control, all of a sudden you're the worst company since sliced bread and it's an absolute disaster. Is there anything, I mean, this is just open to you both, really. Do we think that's anything we can change? Or is that just unfortunately the way that the we're made up as as kind of uh, consumers that we love to jump on something that's not quite right, but very rarely do we praise when something is right. Oh, did you want to say that, Jane? I mean, it's t- it's a tough one, isn't it? Because because you are right, and I mean, the travel industry really experiences that a lot um, through you know the kind of complaining culture. I, I think just making sure that you're timely and that you are, you do speak to your audience appropriately cuts cuts through some of that you know if you can time when when you know and an experiment with when the right time is to send the review um i also think giving additional information like asking questions about for example you know our packaging we have invested a lot of of research into having the best sustainable packaging did you you know um do you find that enhance the product uh, you know the way you ask your questions asking questions isn't enough it's it's what you ask you know yeah, agree. Rich, anything to add to that? Yeah, definitely. Um, like I said, with the culture, 
um, it comes back down to what we just discussed is, back, is, is putting out a wider reputation of yourself. So if people are going onto platforms and they just see negative reviews, they're more inclined to leave a negative review. But if you're sending people there and people are leaving positive reviews, and they're saying this product is amazing. I know what I'm talking about. And then they may look at it going, I'm about to, you know, just just leave a negative review because, like you said, a bit of bubble wraps burst and it's it's not what you expected, you know. It allows them to rethink. So I don't think we can really change that culture. Um, but we can definitely encourage, you know, a better behaviors. I think that follows up beautifully to this next question, which is around dealing with negative reviews. Again, we see this a lot in the travel space, but also in the e-com space where the soon as a positive reviews left, it's like, oh, thank you so much. Like, please tell all your friends and family. Negative reviews left, it's silence, right? Just absolutely nothing. Just pretend yeah. it didn't happen and there's tumbleweed. And so how do we deal proactively with negative reviews? Someone comes on, they make a complaint about X. How do we deal with that without getting into that slanging match of, oh, well, if you'd paid full price in the first place or, oh, if you'd, uh, yeah, just waited an extra day, it would have been there. Like, it's not a, oh, we're right, you're right. It's a case of, okay, we're in a public domain here. There's a public conversation to be had. How do we leave something that's credible without uh, getting into a slanging match? Uh, for us, oh, we're so passionate about negative reviews. Oh, uh, we see it as an opportunity. Um an opportunity to like show people how you respond. Um, because if you respond really positively, I think uh, customers reading your reviews, which we, we already know, they're more like, they're five times more likely to filter your one-star reviews than say your 20,000 five-star reviews that you already have. So they're actually actively looking to see how you respond to negative reviews. They're looking to see what people say about certain things, but if, if, if there is a negative review and you've had a good response, not only, one, you'll have an opportunity to ask them to revise that review, uh, so you're reducing that negative score. But secondly, cu customers will will see that you're active. I think the the biggest pain point for any shop is confidence, confidence that oh, if there is a problem, you're going to be able to sort it out. And if you're showing people that you can sort it out, then that's instilling confidence, regardless of a negative review. So you're almost turning a one star review into a real positive experience for those customers that are a little unsure whether. You know, if there is an issue, you're going to resolve it. Um, and I think that that sings um, massively for success in, 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 in those areas because we've seen negative reviews have, have, a, real neg have a real bad, bad effect on your bottom line if it's not dealt with. So it's really important just to, I think, breathe before you respond. If you're passionate about your brand, maybe get somebody else to respond to negative reviews. Um, you know, ensuring that you can give as clear an answer as possible without getting too personal, I think is the easiest way to respond to a negative review. Yeah, quite agree. Jay, anything to add to that in terms of negative reviews? No, I think that's really great advice. I love the five, what was it? Five times more likely. Five to... times more likely, yeah, it's huge. I think I think that's brilliant. I mean, my background many, many years ago was was more to do with sales. And I'd, I'd say that to, to clients, you know, that that's when we've got an opportunity to prove why you buy through our company is when something goes wrong and how you deal with it. But um, yeah, five times more likely. I love that stat. I'm going to use that. <laughs> Guys, how do we take this to the next level in terms of maybe video reviews or reviews that aren't just text-based, right? So as a, let's say you experience a negative review, as a founder, you're there, you're speaking to camera, you're addressing the problem head on. What do we think of video reviews? Have they got a place in terms of negative reviews? I'm absolutely all for them um, when you're talking about uh, kind of case studies and things like that. I see quite a lot of like business coaches and things like that saying, oh, can you leave us a, a video review? What are your guys' thoughts on video reviews and where do you think they could go this year? James, you want to put that up first? Well, I, I mean, I don't know about from a negative point of view because it depends whether the, you know, whether there's personality behind the brand that's an individual or not. I, I do love the way on, on, um, on social media that they're using comedians to be able to, to create that tone of voice. I think that's brilliant. Um, I, as a consumer, video reviews are, are a superb way of me understanding the product more and seeing kind of what other customers look like and, uh, you know, is this a brand that I want to align myself with? Um, but I, 
I mean, interestingly, you know, um, we're delivering traffic to a site. We don't get involved with with building the site like you do, Nathan. Um, I'd be interested how how are you handling video reviews on a website to stop it from slowing down? How how does it get delivered? Yeah, typically you'll host them on a third party platform, just like you would any review, right? So rather than hosting it natively within the platform, you'd use a YouTube or a Vimeo or something. And then you can embed an iframe, perhaps in a carousel or something like that. I always say that maybe show two or three and then a button that can then take them off to, to see all of them. You don't necessarily need to have pages and pages and pages of them, but just to whet the appetite to say, look, here's a few, uh, I think is probably the way we would normally go about it. Unfortunately, we see too often people uploading gigabytes of a video mm. into a platform and they're like, oh, the site's quite slow. And you're like, yeah, you think? <laughs> that kind of, no jokes, of course it is. Um, but yeah, I would embed it from a third party, let the third party do all the legwork. We sometimes see this with massive documents as well. Sometimes you can use a Google Drive or Dropbox to do all the legwork and then just send the link and the person downloads it. As long as it downloads in the browser and sometimes with documents, you don't really want to take them off to to Google to then do it. But if it can just look at the link, pull it down for you, then then that's exactly what I'd do. So yeah, so with video as well, just to jump on that, like it is literally the future. So it's it was really interesting when we first launched um, video reviews, like asking people to upload video content. Because I think in my mind, maybe I was I was expecting more people talking about a product. You know, maybe those old film reviews used to get, but essentially what we got was we got an insight into people's lives and how they were using those products. And it was great to see like a kid just coming down on the zip line from a, a tree house that dad had made, you know, and you're, you're getting to see exactly where those hot tubs are being positioned, um, which is giving the merchants information they would have never have got before. So they're seeing exactly who's buying them. They're seeing exactly how it's being used. And that's only going to allow them to improve the product to, you know, to see what they use it with and offer more um, than what they would have before. And that would have never been able to, you would have never been able to have got that without video reviews. So I'm see, we're seeing more and more video content being uploaded every single week. Um, I'm, I'm always encouraging people to maybe even ask for it. I think we're not seeing enough of that. We're not seeing enough of people saying, you know, show us, show us exactly how you're using these products. Um, it'd be interesting to see sort of, you know, the conversion rate first of all. You won't want to reduce your conversion rate for reviews, but depending on what sort of stage you are at your business, maybe you're going through Q1 to sort of gauge a, a better understanding of your products and how they are used. So definitely change your review strategy to obtain that data and to sort of really push sort of understanding your, your your products better but also your customers as well got a question here about ugc and user generated content which kind of fits in perfectly from where we were before so all well and good okay some people are leaving video reviews but also really liking it on some sites now where you can see customers in action so like almost uh we've done it with a few clients with an instagram grid where if they've tagged certain things you can just show that so you can see that products like you say in action what can reviews.io do with influencers and kind of uh, user-generated content? I believe there is some functionality already built in. Yeah, you can connect your Instagram so you can actually see anything tagged uh, or the tags that you're looking for will feed into uh, your dashboard. So you can then select what sort of images you would like to use, ask for permission, whether you can use that image or not. And um, it just allows you to sort of mix all that data together, all that social proof information, whether you can publish it then on your website. And it just comes together as a nice body of work, comments from customers uploading images. Um, and we noticed more and more of that happening. So we created tools like our social proof tool, which allows you to take that content and combine it with a text review. I mean, for us, that's so important because we think review content should go further, especially those customers that are not collecting thousands and thousands of reviews. Um, but giving them the tools to sort of take, you know, a handful of good reviews and create multiple pieces of content that you can share socially. So that just builds more and more data to sort of say, well, actually, we only got 10 reviews, but actually, we've now got 100 pieces of content. And you're showing those 100 pieces of content through all of your channels and also publishing, publishing them on your website via our influencer tool, which allows you to sort of collate them all together. 
Jay, this one's probably more for you and it's around remarketing. How can we integrate reviews within our remarketing strategy? I'm, I'm going to just quickly jump on the the, on. the, yeah, yeah. the, the user generated um, content for a second. We just did an experiment um, for um, uh, Cornish Sea Salt, actually, which is a great product um, where they had a, a bunch of user generated content of people using the salt in um, in a little campaign they were doing. And then they had also um, uh, some kind of professional content that they created around it and we did an advertising campaign where we tested which got the highest click-through rate and the, the end result that we needed and the user generator content won out big time it was much more authentic um, and it, it got a lot more engagement it also generated more user generated content so it had an additional impact as well which was fantastic um, from a remarketing point of view, I'd have to look and see how um, that whether how it could be automated with um, with reviews, and perhaps Rich and I could work on that to see how we could pull some of those re reviews into a more automated fashion of of um, remarketing. But traditionally, what we do is we pull out the really important quotes and use it within content that we're already designing ourselves, um, and 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 put you know put it in within quote marks and. Definitely, those ads have a higher click-through rate, even within Google search. Perfect. Thank you both. The next thing here is about in-store reviews. So actually, as we're kind of returning to the high street and we're going back to bricks and mortar in some capacity, how can we collect in-store reviews and uh, kind of share those online and kind of combine the two to get that omni-channel approach as opposed to very much one and then the other? So with reviews, we offer an in-store app. Um, and that allows you to sort of, you know, have, a, have an iPad uh, with a review collector page on there. And, and again, it just you just add that into your process. So a customer checks out and you say, thank you. Would you like to, um, you know, leave a review today? And they can type it in, type in their email address and complete the review. Uh, they'll receive a, uh, an email just to, to verify that that was them leaving the review. Um, so it's a great way to sort of ensure that you're not missing out uh, from, you know, if you are a bricks and mortar. I mean, there are systems in place where you would just take their email address and you may you may send them an invite later on. Um, but I think the benefit of shopping, you know, in a, in a store is that you're there in person. So it's a great way just to say, look, uh, would you mind just leaving a review today? Uh, I hope you've had a great experience. Uh, and if there are any issues, just feel free to come back in. Um, it's a great opportunity because your, your conversion rate will almost be you know, 70 to 100% for, rather than if you send out an email, you're only really looking at sort of a five to sort of 10% conversion. So you know, you can scale your reviews up very, very quickly if you're offering them in store. And I really, I really love that. They're kind of like when you go to the airport and you can tap the green smiley face or the red <laughs> sad face, et cetera. I guess it's pretty similar. Yeah, definitely. It's you've got the options. The only difference is you actually give feedback, uh, which I'm I'm always confused about those dots. I'm like, <laughs> kids are just going there pressing them. If there was yeah. an opportunity to actually leave something, that's a great opportunity to to find out. You know, to get content. Even airports need content, and they're missing an opportunity when and not allowing them to actually leave text content. Jay, anything to add on that piece? I wonder where you guys stand on incentivizing people to leave reviews. Uh, to me, I see it as quite uh, unethical. Uh, again, I, I understand the need for reviews, and actually we want more and more good reviews. But at the same time, if I was to find out that a brand had incentivized, I guess as well, Jet, depends on how it was incentivized. If it was cash, I would start to think, oh, this, this doesn't really stack up. If it's, uh, okay, you can then join the club or whatever again is it incentivizing if you only leave three or higher or is it just incentivizing to leave a review because if that's the case just leave us a review and you can join this prize draw or whatever no problem because you've still got freedom of choice to go one to five but if it's leave us three or higher and get entered then that to me just feels a little bit uncomfortable in terms of well okay someone's only doing that because they want x as opposed to they're genuinely giving their thoughts Rich, I guess you'd be the same as well, or you have a different opinion there? I have, I think, again, very. Um, I've got a good example, actually. Um, 
there's a CBD oil company called Vey in Germany. I think they've just launched in the UK. And I did a recent case study with their marketing director there. And it was really interesting to sort of see how they use, they use Loyalty Lion to sort of reward customers for their time. And the reason why they, they, they really valued that customer's time was because they're, they were kind of restricted of what they can say about their products. They can't say exactly what they think the product does because there's bureaucracy that prevents them to. So they knew that their customer's point of view was massively valued. So they're doing, they're willing to do anything just to get that feedback, just to educate other shoppers. So it was definitely essential to sort of uh, reward customers for their time, essentially. So when you're looking in that stance, it's very, it's so valuable to sort of reward customers because again, again, what you say, we're not, we're not just offering financial uh, benefits just to encourage a positive re review, but are you not rewarding them for their time? Um, because I think you do have to value that as well. So as much as I'm against sort of uh, 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 monetary values to giving a positive review, um, Google is as well. So you can't actually do that for company reviews. You can't actually incentivize uh, your customers to leave reviews, to leave a company review. Uh, you can offer them points and uh, a system like that for their product reviews. So it's, it's again, just valuing their time. And I think that's really important, especially now when you're looking at uh, product reviews and you're asking for so much data and uh, you're asking whether it fits really well. So you can add now um, options or attributes. You, greater attributes to say whether it fits too big or fits too small. You may give a five-star review and it was, the whole experience was amazing, but you know what, the, the dress was really big in comparison to all the sizes that I normally wear. So that's really allows women to sort of give a real insight to the products. Why not reward that with them uh, with, with some points and some time? And, and that is the power of it, where a, a, a customer comes to a product page, is trying to, you know, they read what the, the marketing speak is for its lovely floaty material that looks like this, it looks like that. But then they go down to the reviews and get additional product information that helps them make that choice and, and real product information, you know. I'm normally a size 12, but this was this this was too big for me. Or um, it really does, I think, help that customer experience. So it doesn't always have to be this was the perfect product. Um, yeah. It can give you know additional value. Guys, what do we think about taking reviews to the next level in the form of focus groups? So let's say you got that valuable feedback, and there's maybe 10, 12, 15 people. Have you ever seen brands then taking? 10 to 15 individuals and saying, you know what, now we're going to do more of a roundtable thing where we're going to need an hour of your time and we're going to really break down. So again, seven of you have said that it wasn't quite the right fit. Well, let's discuss that more. Why wasn't it the right fit? What products do you normally buy, etc.? Have we ever seen brands going to that extreme or actually do they just take the data and, uh, and then try and fill in the gaps, if you like, rather than doing that last five yards? I mean, to me, it goes right back to understanding your customer. There's there's a um, a great um, baby clothing or children's clothing company in Cornwall called Frugi. And when they were first starting out, they ran lots of focus groups because their whole kind of USP was that the baby's clothes would fit over reusable nappies. And those are traditionally much bigger. So in order to be able to understand what reusable nappies their customers were using the problems they had they ran focus groups a lot they also then created like an ambassador program so the these people would go out and just you know um promote the product because they believed in it so much because it was solving a problem for them it was not only nice children's clothing but it was solving a problem that, that most little baby trousers didn't fit on their babies um and seeing how those you know really understanding your customer that is what was at the heart of their success. Let's go back to the start here. I've got a question in around, we currently don't collect any reviews. What's our first step to getting started with something like reviews.io? If they had to choose, okay, they can't do everything. We've talked about user-generated content. We've talked about product reviews, company reviews. What is like the, the basic building block to say, you know what, this is a first step into reviews world? Do they go company reviews, just product reviews? Where do you suggest they start, Rich? Uh, interesting question. Uh, that example I said about they, I think that's a, the only really use case where you should be collecting product reviews first because they really need to educate their audience. So if you have a product like that, then collect product reviews, educate your audience based on the review content you're getting. 
definitely start collecting product reviews. Um, we've seen time and time again where product review, uh, company reviews still have the same impact if you're just showing them on your product pages. You're still trying to instill confidence with people. Um, you might not be able to get uh, that, that specific information for the product, but you definitely will be able to share the experiences people have had. And obviously, when, you, when you're talking about percentages on the conversion of review content, you've really got to look way up sort of how many orders you have in a month to how many reviews you're expected to get in that month. So you'll be able to sort of create a plan to say, well, once we've met this milestone, your milestone might be Google Seller Ratings, which is 100 reviews in the course of a year. We can then look at product reviews. So you'll, you'll be, able to, be able to gauge it based on you know, what you're selling, uh, whether you're, you're ready to start collecting product reviews because you know, collecting product reviews, depending on how many products you've got, if you've got one product, one or two products, and yeah, collect product reviews. If you got a thousand products, it's probably better to just start collecting company reviews to start with. And Jay, you you tend to agree with that? Yeah, you know that exact last example. You know, you go to a site that's got a thousand products, and very few actual products have got reviews against them. So that's where you can start to rely on your company reviews. Um, uh, that you know, that's the exact user case, I would say. Guys, a couple more questions just come in. One is about SMS reviews, and do you recommend text messaging uh, to collect review data? In terms of the what you've seen, Rich, is SMS reviews working, or actually is it not really worth it? Yeah, it's definitely picking up. Uh, it has a higher conversion rate, um, and because you're essentially putting it in their laps, uh, people are, are more mobile now. Um, but the key about SMS reviews is they've got to be expecting it. If you're sending them an invite and they weren't expecting a text message from you or it's poorly timed, they're more than likely to you know, be disgruntled and more and try and complain about that. So you've got to be careful. It's got to be well timed. It's got to be well thought out. Um, but they can be very, very positive because essentially you're, you're, giving, you're giving them the opportunity to leave a review where they're looking most, which is on their phone, and you're making it very accessible to Ad use generated content because they're on the phone. So you're removing removing a few steps there. Um, so it can be very, very, very um, a good approach, but you do have to be careful. They have to be expecting your text. Rich, could we use the same example with uh, Facebook Messenger or Instagram DM, etc.? Can we drop review nudges into those platforms too? Uh, definitely encouraged to sort of have a strategy that includes that. Again, it's, it's really depending on where you're selling. If you're selling on Facebook market space, you know, or advertisement there, then it should be an area where people can easily go and check your reviews. So it's, it comes down to the reputation again, making sure that they're, they're being sent to the right locations. Jay, anything to add on to that point? Yeah, I, I, again, I would say nudges are good. Bombarding through every single method of communication is poor user experience. I mean, we all thought that the QR code was dead and SMS, you know, has also had a resurgence. So I think that, that speaking to the customer at the right time, allowing them the option to, to select what they receive from you um, is important as well. Guys, in terms of competitor analysis, Rich, I see on the reviews to IO site, I've uh, been looking for a few clients lately. Actually, you guys can do some competitor analysis. Perhaps you could just touch upon that in terms of what capabilities you guys have to look at other companies in terms of their reviews and then what information you can garner to give to these people to say, yeah, this company's doing X or doing Y and here's your gaps. Yeah, so we allow people to sort of add their competitors and what we'll do is we'll search for their their score their uh, their ratings on all the different platforms and sort of give you an idea of how they're rating across some of those main platforms against how you rate so again it comes down to if you're looking at building your reputation you want to ensure that you are sending your review content to the same areas that your competitors are um so you can really gauge um exactly what they're doing against what you what what you're doing and obviously it's great to look at your competitors because they've probably done the research where their customers are looking so it would probably give you an insight to where your customers are actually going as well so if you aren't on certain platforms then it'd be a good idea to sort of include that into your into your reviews.io strategy and send to those locations 
Rich, one for you and Jay both. Uh, back in the day, we used to see this kind of backlink swapping where you would say, I tell you what, you put a link on yours, I'll put a link on mine, uh, and then we've both created a backlink and hey, off we go, aren't we great? I guess we, we start to see that in reviews sometimes as well when you're part of these communities and it's okay, your contribution to this business this month is that you're going to go and review them. And actually, you've never, ex you've never experienced their product or service and therefore it's technically a false review. Is there anything we can do to to monitor those and weed those out? Or actually, is that just a cheat the system that no one can get around? Uh, it's an interesting subject. It's a good question. And there's there's so many different ways where people are, are trying to sort of create those fake experiences. Uh, the interesting thing is that customers can generally see through it. Um, I think if you've got a strategy that is just focusing on fake reviews, then you should be careful because a lot of them are going to be able, uh, a lot of them are going to be removed. Uh, your customers are going to read them and be like, "That's not a real experience." Um, you can you can generally see what a real experience is against something that's not. Um, so there are practices out there doing 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 that type of thing. Um, as a as a business, this is something we're really hot on. We're looking to constantly improve um, how authentic reviews are. Um, authenticity for us is is, is number one um, on our list, and we need to ensure that you know when people do come to our site, they are reading genuine content. Um, but we've got to constantly evolve because systems are evolving as well, so we need to evolve with them. Guys, question just in here around COVID impacting reviews. Do you both, in your personal experience, think co coming out of COVID, people will be uh, more willing to leave positive reviews and to give feedback, or do you think actually they'll be less willing? I think that it's a it, COVID has pro produced a, a situation where you've got a lot of new or unexpected customers. So, you know, a lot of these businesses online might have only been a part of their sales strategy and then they were having to pivot to it being 80, 90 percent of their sales strategy. So garnering reviews from those new customers is important, but also learning how you can improve as an online business from getting proper feedback from those customers, I think, is going to be important. I do think that this kind of drive to shop local has has improved things, um, and and therefore people do feel warmer towards someone that's local to them rather than just Amazon, you know, delivering. And there's also been a lot more of a drive towards sustainability, um, and again, that produces a warm feeling. You want to evangelize about, you know, something that you think you've discovered that other consumers can benefit from so i think it i think it's a brilliant opportunity to really cement your strategy now my we're getting towards the end of our session today folks i can't believe uh it's gone so quick yet again i've got a question here around the future of reviews and again one for both of you we'll start with you rich and then we'll come to you jay we talked about how video um is going to continue to grow with reviews but actually are we seeing any other technology or any other advancements in the review space that we say you know what in 2021 or 2022, look out for X. Yeah, I mean, video is just going to continue to grow. And obviously, the concerns around video like speed is going to be improved. And again, it comes down to the, I think with COVID, it, everything's just exploded. There's been so much data, so much additional information. I guess we don't know what to do or how to manage it. So I think <clears throat> those key technologies are all talking together. So like Clavio, Loyalty Lion, uh, Gorgeous, you know, all these these apps that you integrate with uh, have, have so much more data to deal with. And you want to do so much more. You want to give better personalization, but it's not always that easy. So I think what's going to evolve is sort of a no-code society. I think these integrations are all going to, these apps are all going to exist, but they're all going to start talking to each other a lot more and be a lot easier to integrate and do a lot more with them. You you can see just with Shopify how easy it is now to just set up a store over a weekend. Building these apps in together uh, together hasn't always been the easiest. And then again, even with ourselves, publishing reviews hasn't always been the easiest. You can you can use our widgets, but now we want to create environments that you know can build those uh, those publishing tools just with a few clicks of the button, just because we need to speed up that process. Everything's changing so quickly. COVID happens, so you needed to adapt so quickly. Um, and I think that's sort of highlighted some issues for some businesses that they couldn't adapt quickly. 
Um, so I think how it's going to evolve is, you know, it's going to have more opportunities to do more and with little, with less knowledge, which is crazy to think. But I think that's that's how it's going to evolve because that's what people want. You've seen it with Shopify, you've seen it with Wix. You know, you create they're creating environments where you you need little knowledge in code. Jay, what about you in terms of the future reviews? Where do you think it may be heading? Yeah, I, th I think that, you know, we've seen oh, some people say it's 10 years of digital transformation in, in just a few months or a year. Um, and we are approaching that kind of year anniversary of, of lockdown soon. And I think that it's a time to consolidate. You know, there were a lot of companies that that pivoted online, that sold more than they ever expected to online. Now it's time to get your data in order to really start to look at your whole customer ecosystem online um, and, and realize that some of those customers probably came quite easily to you during COVID. They might not always come that easily as people get more choice of, of where they can shop. So it's time to consolidate, learn lessons and, um, you know, really explore kind of how you can uh, you know make the most of what you've achieved in the last 12 months perfect thank you guys last few questions please do keep them coming in if you've got any questions we've got rich and jay for another three or four minutes so please keep your questions coming in the next one i've got here i'll try and get through as quickly as possible uh rich one for you do you have to have a product to use reviews.io or can it be service-based no definitely you can it can 100 be service-based you don't need a product um you just need customers <laughs> so as long as you've got customers you can send them review invites and ask them about their experiences um you can set up uh you can set up products for certain services so uh, i think if you look in insurance they'll have home insurance car insurance so you can actually set up even though they're offering a service it's kind of a product a mechanic may do mot's you have products even though you're offering a service that can technically be added as a product and people will want to know how well you do that product because it's something you do time and time again. So initially, people think that they don't actually have products. It's just a service, but these are products. So you should, if you're, if you, if you've collected a lot of company reviews and you want to have specific uh, questions around MOTs and stuff like that, then yeah, definitely you can you can definitely evolve into a product. Perfect. I've got a chance for two more questions. One here, Jay, let's start with you. If you were to take one top tip from today to improve your, <laughs> it's easy to think we forget about occasional marketing, but from our event around occasional marketing with social proof, what would be your one top tip for people to take away today? You may be muted. Muted. We Damn got it. so, we so close. Almost a whole hour. Oh, no. Of that. So sorry. <laughs> anyway, anyone who's playing bingo can now have a shot. Um, <laughs> I'd say that the replying to your negative reviews, seeing those negative reviews, not as something frightening, but as an opportunity to to really get across the ethos of your company. And Rich yourself, one thing to take away from today, what would it be? Yeah, negative reviews as well. It's the reason why I say that as well is I look at search volumes and that's it's always always outweighs anything else to do with reviews. It's how to delete a review, how to remove a review, how to moderate. You know, it's all about removing, but actually it should be respond. So it's make ensure that you can respond to reviews and do it positively. Guys, that's the perfect way to finish. I really appreciate your time today, Rich and Jay. It's been another fantastic session. For those that are interested to find out more about reviews.io, Rich, how do they go about this? Go online. Can they connect with yourself? What's the best yeah. next step? If you've got questions for myself, I'm, I'm very active on LinkedIn. Uh, so reach out to me. Um, and yeah, uh, check out our, 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 our website uh, and you know see what's possible, really. Um, if you've got questions, we've got a, we've got an amazing support team. It's one 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 thing that we really pride ourselves on is that we're when we're, we're we're available. So we've got we'll answer any questions, any concerns that you have, um, and we'll have a dedicated team just to do that for you as well. Thank you, Rich and Jay for yourself as well. For those that want to find out more about the Queen of E-commerce and all things traffic, um, <laughs> where can they come to? 
Um, so yeah, we offer paid media um, management for ambitious advertisers and come along to my LinkedIn profile. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm loving doing these occasional marketing event series. It's really interesting to see how the whole kind of ecosystem for Shopify works together. Very good. Thank you both. Final shout out from myself is around tomorrow's event. If you're not on Clubhouse already, get yourself on there. We're running an event with the MD from Shopify, Europe, Middle East and Africa. It's going to be a fantastic session. We've got Jay joining us. We've got James Davy from the Armory and then myself will be on there too. So head over to Clubhouse. If you haven't got Clubhouse, we'll be coming back to LinkedIn Live next week uh, to repeat that session and to, to change it up a little bit. So stay tuned. Thank you as ever so much for your support. Thank you for watching. Rich and Jay, thank you. Look after yourselves and we'll see you all again soon. Awesome. Yeah. Bye.